Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is one of the stars of one of the best, if not the best, film of the year, The Irishman. In it, Stephanie Kurtzuba plays Irene Sheeran, wife of Robert De Niro's mob hitman, Frank Sheeran. Let's take a look. Frank Sheeran. Is that right? Yeah, you said it right. Uh, under the contract, management can only fire a driver on very specific charges. Everybody, please welcome Stephanie Kurtzuba. Let's hear it. Uh, Robert De Niro, maybe the greatest shrug in cinema history, I think. Nobody quite, nobody shrugs quite like Robert De Niro. Who does so much with so little. Yes. Remarkable in this film, yeah. Uh, he's amazing in this, I mean, everybody yeah. is, is amazing in this movie. Sort of Thanks. Like, like every <laughs> Scorsese movie, which this is your second, right? It is, yeah. Um, you have, uh, you were in Wolf of Wall Street, uh, and you have a wonderful scene in Wolf of Wall Street where, uh, I mean, I despise those characters in that movie, but your scene with him makes me cry. And it's Aww. this beautiful moment where Scorsese forces you to sort of feel what it's like on the very intimate, personal side of their lives, while at the same time you know they are robbing and stealing people yeah, blind. Yeah, they're sort of reprehensible humans, but that's what he does so well. And he does it in The Irishman as well. He suddenly... It makes you feel something for monsters. He, he right. finds the humanity that even in the worst of us <laughs> exists. So you kind of, why am I crying for Jordan Belfort? I don't know. Well, there's something so interesting about Wolf of Wall Street and, uh, and, and the Irishman to me. It's like, it's where Goodfellas and Casino, it's about outsiders in the mafia uh -huh. and, in the, and in the casino world. So all of the monsters are secondary characters or peripheral, but your main character doesn't necessarily kill anybody. They're not the psychopath. Right. Whereas Wolf of Wall Street and the Irishman, your main character is the psychopath. Yeah, they're they're the problem. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. especially with the Irishman, you you see the personal repercussions that someone suffers in being a person. And that's what I like think that. is I mean, there's so many things about the film that I think are so masterful, but that in particular, I remember seeing a screening of it for the first time and I I couldn't believe that I had such um I, I, would, I wouldn't even, I guess the word would be um, pathos for the, for the character who conceivably has not done anything particularly worthy of my affection. Mm -hmm. And yet here he is at the end of his life and you're like, oh, that poor, sad old man. I've just ruined the film for you. No, I haven't. No, everybody oh. knows he gets older. Yeah. It happens to all of us. <laughs> uh, I love that the film is also, uh, it's the story of this bumbling dementia old man who is yeah. most likely lying and is just trying to keep you in his room. Like he's just trying to keep the audience in his room at the nursing home because he's lonely. That's what the whole movie is, the whole story. It's sad. Well, are you saying then that you don't necessarily buy the full line of the, uh, of the story as told by Frank Sheeran? Uh, it doesn't matter whether I do or don't. I personally enjoy the idea that it is an elderly right. member of the greatest generation telling a bunch of lies about history so that he can keep you ostensibly his grandson or grandson's trapped wife in the room like, right, right. there listening to him so he's not a, as alone as he always is because his family hates him. And that is deeply humanizing. I mean, yeah. oh my, how, how incredibly sad to think that at the end of one's life that that's what we're reduced to. Please just don't leave. Yeah. Please just leave the, the leave it just open. Just leave the door open a little, leave yeah. Leave the door open, yeah. yeah. So how did you, going back to Wolf of Wall Street, how did you start working? Because I, I would assume he cast you off of working with you from Wolf. Yeah, that's so right. So how did that happen? I know it was kind of like a bullpen on that movie where you guys were just there every day whether you were going to be in a scene Yeah, it was not. like a mosh pit for months. Um, so, well, I was lucky enough to, for whatever reason, you know, I established this amazing connection with Marty early on during Wolf of Wall Street. And um, I just really, you know, every once in a while you come across people in your life and in your career that you just kind of get each other and you make each other laugh and it's easy. Um, I just got lucky that one of those people in my life happened to be Martin Scorsese. <laughs> um, and we had this ease about us and we would uh, chat between takes and you know, he, he's remarkably smart and he would share wisdom with me about, I mean, everything from cinema history to his own personal, you know, experiences in life. And uh, at the end of filming, he, he came to me and said, I'm doing a little table read of a, of a new project of mine. Would you come and read the female roles? And I, of course, was like, yeah, 
I mean, yes, Martin Scorsese, I will come to your table read. Um, and I showed up and it was uh, Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro. I was completely unprepared. Yeah, exactly. And um, this in like 2013, This was exactly, yeah, 20, it was like 2013. And I thought, well, you know, I'm going to go. The movie shot two years ago, basically. Yeah, we, we didn't shoot it for another five years from that moment. So I, of course, went home and thought, well, this will be one for the for the diary. Like, you know, this is what happened to me today, and that's the end of the story. And then. Do you feel like I did the table read when it comes time to shoot? Oh, yeah. You're going to cast, like, Meryl Streep or of course. something because it's Martin Scorsese. Of, and because Meryl Streep or Sharon Stone or anyone, you know, any of these people that he has, these, uh, Vera Farmiga, would have. It would be incredible in this film, and he could just make a personal phone call. So when that phone call came and it was me, um, I certainly was like, well, I, I would love to audition for any role. And they were like, no, I think Marty actually just thinks there's something you'd be right for. Would you uh, just have a quick five-minute meeting with Bob? Wow. And I went and, and sat with Bob, and he said, you were, you were great at the table read. And I was like, he knows who I am. Um, and then he said, great, I'll see you. I think you'd be great as Irene. I'll see you on set. And I was like, did I just get the job? And he said, yeah. And I said, cool. You know, I played it cool. And then I walked out of uh, the meeting and like proceeded to pull over on 7th Avenue. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so. Was the Irishman, I mean, there are so many, I, I remember reading the actual number of scenes and locations shot for the movie. I don't remember it exactly. It's humongous. A lot. What, is it the kind of situation though, again, where, by and large, you're just kind of on call a little bit for when they need you? Or was it fairly well blocked off that, like, Irene will be needed for these three weeks? It was shockingly well planned out. Now, um, I worked a lot. We started filming in, like, September, wrapped the following March. Um, I was used quite a bit. September, October, November, and then I had like the perfect holiday break. <laughs> I had December, January to my fa uh, to myself and my family, and then sort of went back and and finished up. They had it unbelievably well organized. Um, surprise, surprise, Mark. Surprise, surprise. surprise. Team, but I think it well was perhaps yeah, right. Um, I think it was like the 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 most locations of any feature. Wow. That's what I've heard. Now that may or may not be true. Also, Wolf of Wall Street has the most f bombs. Of any, really? so I have two distinctions. I am in, you know, responsible for at least one or two of the f bombs in Wolf of Wall Street. You said Wolf, right? I fucking love you, Jordan. Yeah, I fucking love you, Jordan. Uh, you said that Wolf was uh, like a mosh pit. Uh, yeah. Expand on that a little bit. Well, it was just the the days were uh, long, and we were this tremendously large group of people, and just the energy that we needed to create for all of those scenes was extreme, and so we all sort of lived at this pitch you know and also in the circumstances of this world it was kind of no holds barred anything goes and a lot of it was improvised so you know there was a lot of uh just a lot of energy constantly all of the time coming up with something fresh something new every take so it really it had that vitality of like being at a rock concert where you're just like ah. i heard that uh through the grapevine as well though that leo very much led that for everybody as well. Like, he was not kind of, like, hiding out in the trailer and coming and doing the scenes. He was very much about making sure that everybody was reaching that pitch off off camera and, and staying there. He was. He's remarkably um, focused and, at the same time, very available and generous. So when he had, you know, three and four pages of dialogue that he was responsible for, he would be, during breaks, added his trailer, just working, working, working. And then when he was in the room with us, we were all sort of invited into his process in so far as like he was there working in front of us. He wasn't disappearing. And he actually came up with the, the whole chest thumping thing that we do in the... Uh... Oh, really? So Matthew McConaughey and Leo had shot a scene uh, yeah. that, that exists in the first part of the film. And apparently Matthew had been doing that sort of as a warm up, And Leo said, what is that? And they had a conversation about it. And then during a lot of those big scenes, Leo just said to Marty, he was like, you know that thing McConaughey was doing? Like, can we use that here? Yeah. And that's how that whole thing came up. That's perfect. Yeah, it was super cool. Very yeah. organic and interesting and yeah. yeah. Uh, so you move, moving into The Irishman, what was it like being on set with De Niro and, and Pesci? I know you had done a table read with them. Right. But on set is a different story. You know, you can't smoke in the car. <laughs> no the smoking the in the car. Yeah. There was a lot of smoking. Um, you know, the thing that was most striking to me about working on the film with these actors was that um, 
they're so normal. Like, I, I don't, I mean, you build them up in your mind. They're such legends. And I, of course, was, you know, you walk onto a set like that and you're inevitably going to walk in with some sense of intimidation. You know, these are masters. Um, and as soon as I sort of got over my own <laughs> mythology of them in my head, I was able to just be there. And what I realized very quickly is they're just actors. They do what, what I do. I mean, really well, but they do what I do. But often really well is kind of like, who knows what that means sometimes. Like, De Niro is incredible, and I know he does his homework, and he works his ass off, but oftentimes really well means something like his shrug looks incredible That's on camera. He doesn't have that much control over that. That's like a born innate thing that the camera just consumes him. It is true. It is also true that there is a lack of, um, like, a... a, a, a a wall between who he is and the work that he does is very permeable. And because he has that ease about who he is and what he's doing, I mean, it sets everyone else at ease. And it gives, at least I felt, it gave me permission to just exist in the story, which, um, I mean, that's when you're doing your best work. When it, and, and Marty's incredible about setting up a set, setting up a set, <laughs> and having a set that allows you to feel that um, lack of self-consciousness about your work so that you can just be. He's a great laugher, right? He's a great laugher. Yeah. That's yeah, he laughs easily, a lot, and heartily. <laughs> That's got to be amazing as a, as a oh. performer on set. Oh, it is one of the thrills of my career. I remember during Wolf of Wall Street, I had, uh, I <laughs> I had improvised a line and during a rehearsal, and I just heard from, like, you know, 50 feet away, <laughs> and I was like, oh, Marty liked that. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the criticisms that I've heard about the Irishman that I don't, I don't personally agree with, I'm also not a woman, <laughs> so I don't know if I, if I, if my agreement or disagreement really <laughs> matters in this, in this, in this criticism, is that the women have very little to say in the movie, um, and very little to do, and they're kind of, for a three and a half hour movie, they are disregarded or at the very least looked over. My yeah. personal opinion about it is that it's about a specific generation that did that, and that the looks and the glances and the silences are far more important than things that are said. And what would have been said may not have been to the men in the room. They would have been to the other women, and none of the scenes can really have that because that's not what the movie's about. I, I actually very much agree with you, and I, I do... I have heard that criticism. I've been asked about that criticism, and I have to say that it's, it, it was not a happenstance that it went down this way. There were conversations yeah. on set multiple times about how do we bring these women more into the story? Where, where are our opportunities to do so? And at the end of the day, I mean, Marty was very cognizant of that and was very collaborative, uh, trying to, to find those opportunities. And at the end of the day, what it came down to is, first of all, everything is in the frame and exists in the film because there's a larger point. And I think yeah. actually what you said is exactly it. This is a world of toxic masculinity in an era where women were silenced. The world was dominated and it was run dominated, by toxic masculinity. Particularly, I mean, it still is, but, yeah, yeah. This, this, not just this era, but this world we inhabit this was n women were not invited in in that way women were indelibly a part of it because they were married to these men or daughters of these men they were not invited in to uh offer their opinions so the fact that marty does such a masterful job making it crystal clear that these women do stand in judgment from the outside is a, a testament to him being inclusive to the women. I mean, this is a movie about peripherally, but I actually do think it very much is about unions and the and oh, unions yeah. at the at oh, a yeah. moment in time where they were at their greatest strength. And that moment in time when they were at their greatest strength, I don't think, and I could be wrong, that women were really that much even of a part of the unions at that point. I don't think Norma Ray had really taken place yet. No, that was that was still to come. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, the only person who, re a female, that really figures into the unions is Jo Hoffa. Right. Josephine Hoffa, but of course she did because she was... Hoffa's wife. Hoffa's wife, yeah. so... Also, I can't remember the actress's name, but it's wonderful to have her back. Since Welker White. She's Welker White. tremendous yeah. in the film. And yeah, you guys would know her from Goodfellas. Remember the hat? The I'm not without my lucky hat. That I gotta get my hat. I, I can't go to the airport. I gotta get my hat. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, I, I found that to be such an interesting criticism of the film in the sense of like, well, it's like almost going in and counting lines for the women. Be like, the women only have these few lines. And it's like, but that is part of the point of the movie. It is part of the point of the movie. And I think it's, it, it can, well, for me, I feel like there's a correlation to the, uh, to the criticism about Wolf of Wall Street. Well, it was just so over the top. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I think that... Do you think Martin Scorsese is not aware of that? Th that's precisely my point, and that was, I know that is true because it was my experience on set. I know these conversations were had. I also think that there's got to be a place in the world as we, as we hopefully continue to enter into a time of varied voices getting their, their opportunity to tell their stories. I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that if the voice is authentic, just checking boxes because of the fashion of the era that we are living in starts to dilute the artistry of the voice. Agree. So instead of worrying about, well, the women didn't have enough to say in this, well, that's not the story that was being told, but how about this? Let's find a f female filmmaker who has something great to say and let's support her and let's get that film made and then not have to worry about how much the men are talking. Yeah. Let's just tell the stories authentically, yeah. you know? And I agree, and it's almost like somebody wants your character or, or Joe Hoffa in the middle of the movie to turn to the camera and be like, hey, why aren't the women talking in this movie? Well, this is what was going on in this I era. Mean, and that's like, you're not gonna get that in a Martin Scorsese movie because no. it would make, it would immediately remove the movie from be, ever being able to be timeless. It would be stuck in 2019 forever. That's precisely, and the, the fashion of the era that we're living in, it, you know. And I also think if we want to do Irishman too. Irene takes Manhattan. <laughs> we'll do that. But have you pitched that to Martin? I don't know. Scorsese? I'm thinking it might be a good idea. I love the idea of you walking over to him in between setups and being like, Marty, Irishman <laughs> two. Irene takes Manhattan. That's all I'm saying. That's I'm just, just thinking. Just think about it. Maybe then she leaves the cigarettes beside and she like picks up a vape and we just like bring it into the modern era. <laughs> I just want to plant a seed, and I'm gonna. Wa I'll go back on. I'm planting a seed here. Do some product placement with Jewel Pods. We've got a whole marketing strategy. Um, and Anna Paquin has a. I, I yeah. feel like a wonderful role Beautiful. in this. And um, like, whether it's Martin Scorsese or not, Anna Paquin would not take a role with one line if she did not feel like it had weight and meaning within the I've film. I've had this very conversation with Anna. Yeah. She she was approached by Marty, and he very specifically said, your character doesn't say a lot, but your character is the moral compass of the film. And she's intrinsic to what I am trying to do here. And she was like, I'm in, I'm in. It's Martin Scorsese. Yeah. And it's a really impactful role if you are not counting lines. Exactly. If you're seeing the larger picture and you're understanding the, the landscape of the world that he's created, you recognize that character has been incredibly powerful in the story. Yeah. So, what kind of uh, you know, as a big fan of his, uh, what kind of conversations do you have with him in between setups and, and like what do you what do you guys talk about? He's uh, he's got such an encyclopedia uh, uh, in his head of film history and films. I mean, I remember talking to him one time about uh, screening Mildred Pierce for his daughter, and we talked about the aesthetics of acting at the 1940s, filmmaking versus different eras. I mean, and he talks about everything from uh, books he's read. We talked about his, um, he's very invested in film restoration. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about South African filmmakers, and he's just... That's He's been another part of my, uh, some of my favorite discourse online with, with Scorsese lately is since he criticized Marvel, lots oh of Mar Marvel fans have come out of the woodwork and said, why don't you put your money where your mouth is and why don't you like invest in some uh, filmmakers that are people of color or women filmmakers? And it was like, he has an entire <laughs> company dedicated to restoring film yeah. by people of color that nobody has ever heard of that yeah. would not exist into the future if it wasn't for the money that he has invested yeah. in it. He's dedicated a huge part of his life into the restoration and the archiving of, of, yes. of these films and these works. And that's what's so interesting, too, to see him collaborating with Netflix at this point because he talks very much about the actual physical loss of these movies 
And that's why he's so interested in, in keeping these stories alive and the, the restoration of the films. And now we're into the world of digital platforms and what happens to, when that information disappears or degrades and what does that mean collectively to us as as artists and storytellers where does that go well i'm hoping that netflix puts together a blu-ray package of some kind of the irishman for me to for me to buy personally well when i talk to him about irene takes manhattan i'll mention that too <laughs> we'll have that conversation <laughs> Um, uh, odd way to go back to it this late into the conversation, but how did you start acting? Um, yeah, I think like so many little girls, I started out dancing, Mm -hmm. dance class and stuff. And being on stage was a very, uh, felt like a very comfortable, natural place for me. And I had parents who were very supportive of the arts and took me to see everything and, uh, now, took me to see everything in Omaha, Nebraska, by the way, to be clear. I was not like going to Broadway shows as a child, um... But it was a, just a very natural progression for me. And then I had that moment of crisis when I went to college of like, oh, I can't do this for a living. I need to be practical. And so that lasted for like a half a semester. And then I went, never mind, I want to be an actor. <laughs> and found my way to NYU. All right. Um, and that's where it all began. So. Wow. When you, uh, you've done a lot of things. You've been on TV, you've been in movies. When you're working with someone like Martin Scorsese, is your main job your main goal is it a paralyzing fear that you can have to just make sure that you show up every day ready to go and you're never on camera dropping a line or like (laughs) having to figure something out that's my main goal for every job i've ever had yes but certainly the stakes do feel higher on a scorsese film um but here's again i say he creates an environment for you to feel to be successful um and so, yeah, you do the prep work and you show up and see what happens. Marty is a huge proponent of uh, improvisation because I think he just has such an eye for authenticity. Like he's, his bullshit meter is finely tuned, um, which is great because as an actor, that just forces you to live so completely in the circumstances that you've been given. But when you are being supported by the costumes of Christopher Peterson and Sandy Powell, and you are being supported by the art direction of Bob Shaw, and, you know, you can't go wrong. You've been given a place to live. Now just be there. Right. And his, uh, Marty's deft hand will guide you. Uh, we had Ray Liotta here a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about when he got on Goodfellas and how nervous he was. Yeah. It was only his third film. Oh, I wow. Think he really? Said maybe his fourth, because he had done something wild in like 86 or 87, oh. and then Goodfellas was shooting like in 89 or 90. Uh, and he was saying how nervous he was. And then he was like, but then when you get there, you know, you're nervous to be around Robert Juno, but he's calling line like anybody else. He's just, he's a person, he's a yeah. human being, and he's doing, you're doing the, the work. Yeah. You're just you're just doing the work. I mean, I do remember my first day on set of, for Wolf of Wall Street. Um, there were uh, it was a big pool party scene, and we were all holding you know fake glasses of champagne, which there were just yellow jackets swarming because it was ginger ale, and they wanted the sugar. And I got stung, and um, I'm allergic, of course. You know, day one on a Scorsese, and like you're, I'm the asshole who got. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who gets stung and has to go to the medic? And, um, you know, we're sitting there and I've got my hand fixed up and he walks by me, Marty, for the first time. And meanwhile, we haven't had any real interactions yet. And he goes, so I heard you got stung. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I did. He's like, are you okay? I'm like, oh, I'm fine. He's like, yeah, well, you're, you're doing a good performance. You're, you're doing a good job. And I just, like, didn't miss a beat and just said, well, it's because I'm classically trained, Marty. And he thought that was the funniest thing in the world. So that's. Did you were you being funny or were you? Oh my God! Yes. Okay. Okay. No, I'm not that pretentious. <laughs> a little, not that much. Uh, but I am classically trained, Ricky. Just to be clear. Over there. Right. Right. NYU. NYU. <laughs> uh, we have time for a couple questions from that end. Who's the question right here? Hi, I'm Gloria Jewels, Hi. and it's so exciting that you get to play. Uh, role with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino because they're like huge. Yeah. And do you get to interact with each of them? Yeah, I spent I spent a tremendous amount of time with Bob. Um, I had I spent less time with Al, um, but mm-hmm. I definitely did get to interact and had a few scenes with him. And he is one of the most entertaining people I've ever spent time on a set with. He's just he he's just like a big Labrador puppy. He's super fun. He's a really yeah, fun. This, yeah, this is the big time. Yeah. Playing with these, uh, with it these is. actors. So. 
I'm excited to see it. I'm looking forward to seeing. Thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, your scenes with uh, you have scenes with Joe Hoffa and yeah. with and and with Jimmy, right? Like in yeah. the cabin together or in yeah. the hotel together in the cabin, right? When we're when we're having ice cream and the kids are with us and and we're playing mini golf and. Does Pacino? Um, when he's not in character, speak that way as well? Does he have those incredible pregnant pauses between things and that sort of rhythmic take on all of his... Actually, feet? yeah. I mean, a little, maybe a little less so than he does on screen, but he absolutely does. It, yeah, you're very aware you're talking to Pacino. <laughs> uh, one more. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you have a dream collaborator. Ooh, what a good question. I have so many dream collaborators. I'll tell you who I would absolutely kill to work with right now is Ava DuVernay. I just am completely fascinated by her right now and, and the work that she's doing. Um, so, you know, maybe that'll happen. <laughs> Um, Stephanie, it's been a pleasure talking to you. you Thank too. you so much for being here. Thank the you. Irishman is um, in theaters right now, uh, and it's going to be on. It's coming to Netflix this next week. That's right, the twenty seventh for Thanksgiving. Whoop, whoop. So sit down with your family and watch the Irishman. That's I'm right. Thinking, and I'm you probably going to do that. You can pause it, take yeah. a break, come back. But I can say you're not going to want to pause it. I don't think you will either. It's three and a half hours. I sat down in the theater. At no point did I ever want to get up and go to the bathroom or get any food. It is. Utterly compelling from minute one to minute 336 Thank or you. whatever it is. In the words of my sister, Kim, that was the shortest three and a half hour movie I've ever sat through. Absolutely. It feels like 90 minutes. Yeah. And you have, I still have no idea how he did it. Magic, Scorsese magic. It really is magic. <laughs> Stephanie Kurtzub, everybody, let's hear it. Thank you.